What's going on guys? I hope everyone's belly's full of turkey. It is Thanksgiving, so we want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. It is Brian and Jack with Simple Man's Comics, and this is The Bolo Show, where we are talking about the hottest comic releases of this week. We're talking about first appearances. We're talking about reader buzz books. We're talking about variant buzz books. But Jack kicks it off at the end with his long-term play. Jack, how was your new comic book day? You know, new comic book day was great. Kind of low-key. Uh, the kids were off school, so I got to kind of spend some time with my daughters. We actually read some comic books together, which was fun. Uh, but, you know, you're talking turkey, Brian. I'm ready to bring the stuffing. I'm ready to bring the cranberry sauce, the mashed potatoes, the yams, the whole nine, even that green bean casserole nobody wants to eat. I love green bean casserole. My whole wife's side of the family hates green bean casserole. So I eat it up, and then, of course, I make the family pay for it later on that evening without getting into too much <laughs> details. But let's get into the Bolo Show. Before we do that real quick, it is important to know that this show is brought to you from Nick at SlabbedHeroes.com. Nick Dortman selling those guaranteed modern 9.8s for a great price, great customer service. He also has raw comics, so make sure you check him out at SlabbedHeroes.com. And we'll have the Bolo list. So this is this week's Bolo list. It's a holiday week, so kind of a, what you would expect. If you think this is slow, wait till Christmas week. But, yeah, I mean, anything anything stuck out to you this week, Jack? Yeah, you know, um, this week for me was all about the Venom anticipation. Uh, a lot of people were waiting on that. Um, but like you said, it was a smaller list. I think there's some good books. Um, it maybe lacked that one killer but there was also some books people were talking about that didn't make the list. And that's where I encourage you guys, if there's a book you're passionate about, you got to post on, on social media about it. Um, I know we heard about Batgirl 37 second print. We heard about Hellblazer number one. And neither book really had solid momentum on social media. Right. I mean, we even spoke about Hellblazer as one of our picks on the last call show that we were right. looking forward to that. Didn't have a lot of buzz, so it wasn't on the bolo list. But yeah. What was on the bolo list were some first appearances, and we're going to get into that right now. And the first book on the first appearance list was this Conan 2099 one-shot. Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I've gone on record saying that I, like, I don't long-term buy into the, co the 2099 stuff. And I think Conan 2099, while cool, is, is maybe a character I buy into the least futuristic Conan. But, um, yeah, I mean, it is a first appearance. If they ever do anything solidly with the 2099 program, like an animated film, I feel like could work. Um, this is a first appearance that could have legs down the road. Who knows? I haven't read it. So if you've read it and you like it, let us know. I know Brian's a big Conan fan, but I know this kind of drifts outside his typical Conan reading. But this is one where we rely on the community. Um, don't ever feel some sort of way if we talk negative about a book. Or we're not, you know, a book's not our pick. We say this all the time. We are sports talk radio for the comics industry. So this is two guys' opinions. That doesn't mean that it's it's Bible verse here. It, you know, we our opinion can be wrong. Our opinion cannot be shared by you. And if you can sway us in a different direction, by all means, we invite that. So let us know in the comment section if you read this, if you liked it, if you loved it, if you hated it. I want to hear either way. Right, I am a huge Conan the Barbarian fan. I have been reading that whole run. But this is one of the books, like, I don't want to pick it up because of 2099, but the reader in me wants to pick it up to see how the story is. Um, other than that, I probably wouldn't touch it. I'm not a big 2099 fan. We've, we've said that before. But like you said, it, let us know in the comments. I'm going to pick it up regardless and give it a read, definitely just because I'm a huge fan of Conan. But either way, let us know, did you read it and did you enjoy it? Then the next book on the reader buzz, we're talking about Angel Number Seven. This kicks in, ties into the whole Hellmouth story arc, right? Right, and this is again. I I've been reading the comic series. I'm not a huge. Uh, I'll just not even say not a huge. I'm not a fan of the old Buffy TV show or or Spike or Angel. Um, so these are new characters to me. Um, but these, the Morgan sisters appeared in the Buffy TV show for a number of years. So this is a reintroduction for many, for many old school Buffy fans. And that's been the cool thing about these series, Brian, 
is we've gotten kind of a mix of like some new characters as well as some returning characters. And what I like about what I'm hearing from long time, um, long time kind of uh, fans of Buffy is that there has been talk of these characters when they get reintroduced, they have kind of a different edge to them, a different feel. It doesn't feel like the character from the TV show. Um, I've even seen other YouTubers talk very passionately about that. And I think that that does a lot for me, for my confidence that, and now the solid rumors coming out. I don't know if you've heard this, Brian, that the, some sort of Buffy property is on its way. Um, you know, I think that, reinventing these characters through the comics is going to do well. So it'll be interesting to see when a newer version of Angel and Buffy or whatever they end up calling it um, hits the big screen or hits the small screen. Will it be these reinvented versions from the Boom Studios run that are the most desired or will people go all the way back to the Dark Horse, say, true first appearances of characters? That is going to be the test of the market. Yeah, I wasn't a fan of the show. I did like the movie, you know, Christy Swanson, um, <laughs> but wasn't a fan of the show. We've had that discussion here. I have been enjoying the series between Buffy. It's not like my favorite go-to series, but it's one of those ones where once I've gone through my reading pile, these are one, always ones that are great to pick up and read. So it's enjoyable. It also is important to know that the cover on the far right, that was the incentive variant for it, right? It was a 1 in 20? 1 in 20 or 1 in 25. Right. Uh, probably like 1 in 20. But yeah, those those uh, incentives can be tough to find. Uh, not a lot of stores ordering those high numbers. And another thing, if, if you just started to pick up on the series, be on the lookout. Starting issue number nine, Angel's title changes to Angel and Spike. So if you're looking for your normal Angel title and you don't see it, but you see that Angel and Spike, it's the same series. Right. And there it is. That wraps up the first appearance section this week. So do us a favor. Click that thumbs up button for us. Let us know in the comments what books you guys picked up this week. But with that being said, we're going to roll right into the Reader Buzz section. Starting with the book we've been high on lately, and this is Detective Comics number 1016. We talked about how Mr. Freeze has brought Nora back. We talked about how Nora was like, screw you, I'm going out on my own. And then here we are picking up where she's kind of gone off on her own. And then Mr. Freeze is just a little sobby, sobby, working with Batman to get her back. And um, I read this issue, still enjoy it. I started getting a little tired of Mr. Freeze, but that's just, that's his character, right? I mean, the whole time it's always been the love of his wife and trying to get her back and now she's alive and she's like, I'm, I'm gone. I'm doing my own thing. But right. um, did, did you get a chance to read this yet? I did. And it's funny. You and I have the same assessment of this. So when I was reading it, I found myself getting annoyed by Dr. Freeze. But then I didn't like that because I started thinking back to, again, we're both pro wrestling fans. And I'm tired of this whole beta cuck type thing that yeah. they keep doing to men where it's like. Rusev and. Right. We went through 25 years where men weren't allowed, where men were constantly told that, like, we don't have feelings or, you know, we don't we don't express our emotion enough. And then as soon as men start having feelings, now you're all beta cucks and this, that and the third. And it's like, where do we fit in here? Um, you mentioned it like his entire being, his reason for everything he did was to get Nora back. And if you can take five seconds and put yourself in his shoes um, now, granted. I'll say for my women out there, it's pretty misogynistic that he thought that like he was going to free her and suddenly she was just going to fall in line and be his number two. But at the same point, um, you know, that was what his motivation was. He did everything for his wife. And here he finally achieves kind of what he thinks is going to be his crown jewel. And it is not going the way he planned. Nice. Um, and, and then he gotta, doesn't even blame her. He blames it on no. the serum he got from Lex Luthor. Right. But then that shows you the kind of guy he is, right? Like, just like, you know, he couldn't take responsibility for anything that he's done throughout the comics history because it's not my fault. I've got to do this for my wife. And you got to think how desperate he is to be teaming up with Batman. You can tell he kind of hates it, but he doesn't really have another option. And I still look at his wife and I go, she's a badass character. But yeah, I mean... It sounds cliche, but that bitch is ice cold, man. Yeah. 
but but the next one on the reader buzz is Batman Beyond number thirty eight. Right. So this one um, it was highly anticipated coming out of thirty seven. Um, I don't know if it'll have any collectability. Um, it, you know, it's not obviously not a first appearance. Thirty seven was that first appearance. You had the kind of the cameo in the issue before. Um, issue twenty five is taken off as people pure speculation by the way there's no real i think there might be right but there's no real proof that says that uh dick grayson's sister is the batwoman beyond that's just people guessing and that 25 is taken off to astronomical prices no i mean i i think it's gonna pan out to be honest with you but i it's that's still still nuts to me that people are paying those prices when we have no clue um but 38 you get this battle between blight and batwoman um, Batwoman's trying to learn how to use her suit. You end up getting uh, the first meeting of Batman Beyond and Batwoman Beyond. Um, so I think it's just setting up things to come. It looks like Batwoman Beyond is going to be here to stay for a while. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Brian, this is really reminiscent to me of the Detective Comics run where really Batwoman was um, introduced into like the scene. It really reminds me of the way that that story arc is playing out where – She's kind of enters and takes over and is kind of in charge, and then they integrate back together, and they have to learn to work together. Um, and I think that's why Bruce is kind of the old man centerpiece of this whole thing. Works really well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm still picking up just for the story. I don't, I'm not caught up in the the hype of first or whatever. It's another one of those ones that I enjoy because it's usually underappreciated. So it's one of those like little secret like this is a good story i'm gonna read people are aware of it i mean it's got its fans so they wouldn't be printing it still and they're printing as many as they are but people are hyped on it right now for like you said the whole batwoman beyond um, now the book that had some major buzz this week was avengers number 27 right so you had a couple different things the, the star brand stuff was what was heavily marketed right that's what we heard about and it's funny because i was sitting there like star brand and I can't yeah. I like wrap my brand. <laughs> I can't wrap my head around that. That was like a nothing comic when I was a kid. But um, what we ended up getting was Silver Surfer Black showing up in this issue, and I think that that's more the reason why there was a late push of people posting about this book um, and adding this book, you know, to their last second pickups. Um, this is the type of title that you can usually. Even if it's not on your pull list, you can still pull one off the shelf at your LCS on a Wednesday because, you know, shops tend to order extra on books like Avengers. Um, and there was a lot of that last second posting of like, hey, I'm grabbing this book. I actually saw that 2099 book posted quite a few times with Deathlock. Deathlock's a funny character. Like, he's a D-level character. But whenever he's on a cover, people seem to pay attention. A lot of people are liking that incentive variant. I don't... I think just because of the ratio itself, I don't I don't see much to the actual yeah. book, but to each their own. Then the next book we're going to talk about on the Reader Buzz was Philadelphia. This was another one that we talked about on the last call show. They had the regular cover. Then they had that 1 in 25 variant that was, that seems to be the hot one right now. And then that far one on the right is another one we talked about on the last call show where that was the local comic shop day exclusive. Right, and I'm waiting for when the inevitable series announcement that everything gets optioned, right? Who, who Who's going to try to make the case for the local comic shop day to be the, the real first appearance because it came out first? When Who's going to be the first YouTuber to make that claim? <laughs> we'll, we'll have to check that out. But um, that Matina variant's on fire, Brian. Have you yeah. seen what that thing's going for? Yeah, I mean, even like even like stores like Midtown and 1 in 25 are selling it for, what, 60 or 70 and then I haven't seen it, what it's going for on eBay right now. So people are confused whether that's a one per shop or a one in 25. From what I understand, it is a one in 25 variant. But if you ordered less than 25, you got one. So everybody got one. And then beyond that, it was one in 25. Now, that's just what a dealer told me who orders a lot of books. Um, that I don't have that confirmed from four or five sources, but that's what I was told. So there may be a little more of that book out there, but I don't think it was a book. I think that was a book that stores got in and flipped real quick, right? And usually one per store variants tend to dwindle, you know, by this point in the market. 
Um, there's only one active at auction on eBay. It's at $55 with like a solid amount of time left. Uh, shout out to Andy from the Indie Spotlight series who's been covering this book heavily. Um, I just think it's a, a perfect marriage of independent horror mixed with mainstream artists who just kind of killed a very gruesome cover. And um, I think this book has legs. The question is, I didn't read this book, Brian. Is Philadelphia a good book? Because I don't care what the variant artist is, or is if if Philadelphia doesn't um, have some sort of sustainability as a book, it's not going to matter. Um, and I, that's the one thing I would caution variant buyers: is it's very rare that you ever will see an independent variant take off, and then the book sucks. Um, you know, you look at a book like Usagi Yohimbo, and it's number six variant that came out a couple weeks ago. That's a classic book, classic character. Um, so, I'm not downing. Philadelphia. I like uh, Jason Sean Alexander's work. He actually liked the Bolo list this week, as a matter of fact. So uh, shout out to him. But um, I would caution people, read the book, man. This is why we talk about, Brian. One thing you and I said when we got together, right? We wanted to get people, especially in the collecting, speculating, all these fringe comic communities, read these books. Read them first. Be a reader first. Um, because you got to make informed decisions. I read the book. What'd you, oh, tell me what you thought. I actually liked it. I mean, in case you're unaware, I mean, you kind of give away on that variant there, but it's a vampire. It's a vampire story, but um, the main detective that was on the case is from Philadelphia. That he's dead. The son is coming up from Baltimore. The son is a Baltimore PD, and he hates his dad. Like. It's the whole kind of narration, the kind of narration that's going on in the background. There's some flashbacks there of of, of the um, dad on the detective work of the case. And then how he's coming back up there. He just wants to take care of things and get back to Baltimore. Basically hated his dad, didn't want to be like his dad. And he kind of is becoming, following his dad's footsteps as far as police work goes. <clears throat> and it stems back to, um, the vampire outbreak seems to stem back to second president john quincy adams with yellow fever because they're noticing a lot of these victims are i hate to always reference the wire because but when you see stuff it kind of reminds you oh, of what you know i hate to reference the wire i love when you <laughs> reference the wire so a lot of the victims are vagrants druggies you know stuff like that and they're noticing that they also have yellow fever so then they tie the yellow fever back to john quincy adams um and then he still doesn't think this is true. He thinks his dad, he finds his dad's journal. He's reading his dad's journal. He's like, my dad didn't tell me shit. He's like, the only way I can find out about him now is read the journal. And he finds all these notes. And then he thinks his dad's freaking cuckoo because he's talking about the, the vampires. And then he goes to follow up on it. And basically it, towards the end of the book, he finds out that, yeah, the whole story is real. So it was a good first issue. I enjoyed yeah. it. If you, um, <clears throat> Sean Alexander's art in there is phenomenal. It kind of brings the book to life. Uh, but if you don't like vampire books or you think vampire books are kind of played out, you might not like it, but it does have kind of that um, street-level detective police story. So it's kind of like daredevilish vampire. You sold me on the book more in that aspect because I'm kind of tired. You and I have talked about this, like vampire state building. I'm kind of tired of vampire books. Yeah. Um, I'm excited for V Wars on Netflix. Yep. That was a book I really loved. But that's the point is, I really loved The Strain. I really loved V Wars. I'm, and I'm just kind of like, how many vampire books do I need? Having said that, I like what you were saying about the street level detective stuff. That always, that's my kind of. of yeah, it's uh, called, like Vampire in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. But not a comedy. <laughs> but. But yeah, I enjoyed it. I'm glad I picked it up. Detective and Philadelphia are the two books I was able to read today because I had like no time, but I was able to at least get those knocked out. That's and, awesome. And enjoyed both of them, so I was glad I picked those. And that's going to wrap up the Reader Buzz section, but we're going to go right into now, into what everyone likes to talk about, and that's the Variant Buzz. The first book that we're going to talk about is Star Trek Picard Countdown. This was what... A, 1 in 25, but they also had a 1 in 10 variant for this. Yes, and both are selling well above ratio. And this doesn't surprise me at all, even though 
They're almost like photorealistic images. They're kind of like the advertisements for the show. First off, Star Trek fans are hype for this new Picard show. Um, apparently, this was kind of like a passion project where um, they were kind of like, well, what what, what would, could we do to get you to play Jean-Luc Picard again? And he was like, this is the story I would tell. So when you get actors invested and involved like that, um, you know it's going to be good. I like the fact that it's going to be on the streaming service. Um, so you'll be less encumbered by kind of the advertising element of it. It's not like it's going to be a Netflix thing. Is this but CBS? Be, yeah. The like CBS same thing as Discovery? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that hurts it, though. The show. I think I think it'll hurt its wide appeal. Yeah. Because, I'm, full disclosure, I don't have the CBS app, but I think I'm going to get it. I, I want to watch – I used to watch The Big Bang Theory, and I didn't see the last two seasons – um, because it, I, it wasn't working on my schedule, calling DVR so much. Um, and I was like, well, I'll, I'll catch it on the app. But then there wasn't enough on the app. But now the CBS app is starting to put together um, some solid stuff. Uh, I watched the pilot of um, Twilight Zone. I liked that. I don't mind binging some Twilight Zone um, Discovery. I'm a Star Trek fan. I'm not a Star Trek diehard, but I've said on this channel a lot, like I respect other fandoms and I, I would like to check out Discovery. And this, I mean, the one, my dad was a diehard Star Trek fan. That was his thing. Star Trek was his thing through and through. And the next generation was his kind of favorite incarnation of Star Trek. So my most vivid Star Trek memories were as a kid, almost being forced to sit down and watch uh, Star, you know, John Luke Picard and uh, uh, Number One and Data and all that. So I'm excited um, as an adult and with my father having passed on now to kind of revisit that storyline. So I think the CBS app now has enough content that it's worth checking out. But I do think for wide appeal, it will hurt them. But they need flagship programming like this if they're going to sell that app. Yeah, so I think like Discovery, right, they probably, I think they aired the first episode and then the rest was on the streaming service, so I don't know if they're going to do that with Picard. But you talk about Star Trek fandom, <clears throat> so, but you talk about Star Trek fandom, I want to take this time right now to recognize Friend of the Channel, it's got their own channel, we're talking about Downright Nerdy Podcast, they're doing episodes on the podcast, on their YouTube channel, leading up to this, they're doing reviews of Star Trek, so if you're a Star Trek fan, or if you're a fan of geek and pop culture in general, Make sure you check out Downright Nerdy Podcast. Michael Carls, Riley Sloan, great group of people. Fantastic channel That's all I got to say. No, I got asked today. Um, I was doing a uh, kind of Q&A on Instagram. Somebody asked me today um, what my favorite YouTube channels were. And they were one of the ones I listed. Um, I think they are a fun and exciting channel that does not get enough attention. So if you're a diehard Star Trek fan... Or you're somebody who wants to learn about Star Trek, even more importantly, um, check out this series that they're running right now. Then moving into the next one on the Variant Buzz list. This is Fallen Angels number two. This is that Peach Momoko and Cinna variant. Yeah, everybody seems to love this one. Full disclosure, I hate this variant. <laughs> I, just, I just, and I don't mean to be, I like Peach Momoku, but this one just doesn't do it for me. Yeah, it looks like a sketch uh, card. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a good assessment because it looks like something you just, whip up real quick um but this was one that people were talking about instantly um whenever the uh whenever the books were initially put up like on midtown last week you know you know midday wednesday when the next week's books are put up this book got bought out instantly people were all over this so i knew this one was going to be like an above ratio type book and anytime you have a book with uh x23 on it it's stands a chance of doing better than most. Right, and then Fallen Angels, I, I enjoyed the first issue. I haven't read the second issue, but Peach Momoko is starting to have kind of that following as well. So so now you have multiple collectors that like the Fallen Angels, like the fact that it's a 1 in 25, yeah. like that's the next 23, and it's a Peach Momoko. So that's kind of where you get the popularity of it. I'm not a big fan of Peach Momoko's art style. I can see how people are. But just my personal opinion, it doesn't doesn't hit me the way some other artists do. 
I think she's hit or miss. I think that like the X twenty not X twenty three the uh, the Ghost Spider variant she did I thought was pretty good. The North Carolina Comic Con, if you haven't seen it, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one uh, variant is incredible. Uh, it's 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 basically like a Japanese movie poster for the Ninja Turtles. It's it's phenomenal. But I think she's hit or miss for me, and that's just my opinion. I know there's probably somebody out here who. Loves everything she does. But this one, when I saw it, I was like, man. Definitely stands out, though. Want. I mean, you can see it covered, and you know that that's her yes. style. Yep, without a doubt. Then the next book we're going to talk about on the variant buzz list is Scream number one. Now, this is the art germ variant for it. Yeah, and, you know, we were talking earlier in the year, Brian, about art germ fatigue, right? That was a, a common thing that you and I were discussing. And we were talking about the fact that, you know, there, he seemed to be everywhere. And it's almost like our germ hurt us. Not necessarily us, but people like us kind of with that sentiment. And he worked really hard this year to switch his style up in various different ways. His Catwoman series um, where he kind of showed different art styles. And then even this book. This book doesn't look like a typical art germ book. It's not a book that I look at and it screams to me. Art germ obviously did this. And I like that. At the same point, he didn't compromise any quality at all to do this. And uh, he's had a really good year. And if we were putting out, like, Artist of the Year Award people, he would have to be, to me, a nominee. Um, the This book, I'm on the fence about, and like a lot of his books. Um, it's not an incentive. It's It's a regular priced variant. Marvel is using these books to sell copies. Um, DC does the same thing. Um, art germ variants tend to get high orders from shops, but we get little to no secondary market value on it. And this is what I want to ask the community. I'd like to pose this as a question to you guys. What is more important to you? Would you, ra- and, and I ask this just honestly, cause I go back and forth. Would you rather have see artists like Jason Campbell, who they typically do this with as well? Adam Hughes, who they're doing it with more and more. Would you rather see these guys go back to doing more limited 1 in 25, 1 in 50 incentives? Or are you happy with the accessibility of these books being cover price variants you could pick up on release day for cover price? Luckily, it seems like a lot of retailers have stopped taxing and overcharging for these. But um, what what do you what would you appreciate more? The accessibility? you know the inexpensive nature of adding them to your collection or the collectability long term of the ratio variant what is more important to you i would love to know because i sit on the fence myself i like the accessibility the problem that i get with accessibility is sometimes they're always accessible because they got that artist doing a bunch of different covers for the series so i like less art germ covers but at the accessibility of, of the regular price. Yeah, and the unfortunate thing is I don't know if that's how it works on like the supply and demand curve. Like I think the more accessible that they are, the more they end up doing. Yeah. Um, it seems like. So I, I don't know. I don't. In a perfect world, yes, you're right. And then I think you'd then I think you wouldn't have that problem because I think secondary market values would raise because people would want these books and they'd sell out. But um, yeah, when, when you've got Archer I'm doing a Supergirl variant every month and then a Catwoman variant every month, um, it's it's easy not to miss an order on those, right? So you're not going to have that problem. But yeah, I agree. Gorgeous cover, and it's nice that it's cover price. Yeah. The next one we're talking about on the variant buzz is Folklords. This is issue number one, but this was the second print for it. Right, and... Uh, I reread Folklords this week. I read it actually today with my daughter. Um, I decided, you know what, this book, I don't know if this is meant to be an all-ages book, Brian, but I was like, you know, this book didn't really have anything outside of anything that I feel like my daughter can handle. I did tell her, though, if issue number two starts to take a turn, we're not going to read this together. Um, but this book is, in my opinion, one of the best books on independent um, scene that I read this year. I really enjoy it. It's a little, I like kind of like the darker horror suspense stuff. This is a break from that. And I really didn't think I would like this book. Um, but I'm very excited to see where this book is going to go. 
Um, and I really like Matt Kent's writing style. I've mentioned that before on the channel. Um, in this book, what you really get is a narration mixed with, um, you know, a traditional kind of like conversational storytelling. And the narration is almost funny. And it really kind of plays off of um, Ansel and Archer and all of these characters in the book. Uh, the this, this second print, same sort of situation we've seen in the past, Pass with Boom. I'm not going to get into this real long because I was just telling Brian beforehand that I want to do an entire video on this subject. But um, there are some people upset about the accessibility of the second print. We tried to warn people that this was going to get allocated. Um, it, the book's selling for 15 on the lowest I've seen to as much as 25 to 30. Um, this is going to continue to happen in the market when you have a second print come out two weeks after the first print. Because you're having to solicit orders for the second print while the first print still has yet to land in the public's hands. So there's a lot of stores who aren't going to order these second prints. Um, they're not going to get involved in, in this because they're not going to be able to anticipate the heat. And then they're going to try to get on board later. And even if it's pre-FOC, once those initial orders are looking kind of what they're looking, they're going to cut off because they got to go to printer sometimes even before that FOC date. They've got to at least get that number in. And with the returnability of Boom number ones because of the Boom Guarantee Program. And Boom's not the only one who does that. IDW does that. Image Comics does that. There's a lot of companies that do returnability on number one issues. Um, that's a lot of liability for a company to take to sit out there and say, well, yeah, we've got 25, 30,000 copies of a number one on the market. And, you know, um, we'll go ahead and print up another 5,000 number number one second prints. That's not these second prints are truly created to get into the hands of the stores who don't have first prints on hand, who are hitting diamond up looking for copies of this book. I don't know if, if everything's working the way it should and everybody's getting what they feel like they should get, but we also live in an entitled culture, right? Where everybody feels like they're owed everything and at, at the price that they want it at. And that's just not the way things work. Um, so I wish people would, when things like this are hard to find, would just enjoy the chase, man. Sometimes you're going to get it. Sometimes you're going to not. Sometimes you're going to have to pay a little more. But um, I used to love New Comic Book Day, Brian, going and hitting three or four stores trying to find that hard-to-find book. That excites me. There's not much else I can say about this title that hasn't been said already. If you haven't read it, again, highly recommend you do so because it is just a fantastic story. I understand it's the first issue, but it really sets the pace and sets the tone for one fantastic, epic, like I always said, Dungeons & Dragons meets the village. But you can relate it to, I could see it playing out like a Harry Potter type phenomenon if it were to catch on that way. That's how much I like this story. With that being said, we're going to move on into the next one, which was Captain Marvel number 11. This is the second print for this as well. All right, so this depicts the, the turn towards dark Captain Marvel, right, that we see in 11. Um, so while a very cameo-ish appearance at best, it, there's going to be that argument between 11 and 12. I remember originally when I started saying that I thought 11 could be a first appearance of Dark Captain Marvel. But this is, this is Brian, why sometimes I hate the secondary market. Um, and this is why you and I have made changes in the way we want to talk about comics and deliver content about the secondary market and speculation in general because – you can't win for trying sometimes. So when th this book came up with number 11, I read the book. The, the tagline that everybody likes to use, right, is the market decides, right? But how do you know what the market's going to decide on release day? You don't know. Um, and when I'm making this list the night before, I certainly don't know. So um, I read the book and I was like, I don't know. I could see it looks like she's getting her powers there. It looks like she's turning dark. But is that is she really dark Captain Marvel? I mean, she's not wearing that costume. Or well, she could uh, be going through menopause. <laughs> you don't know. So um, it's funny. When Eleven came out, I mentioned that I felt like it might be a first appearance, probably a cameo. I got my head chewed off. Then issue 12 came out, and I called that the first appearance of dark Captain Marvel. And I also got my head chewed off and was told I just missed issue number 11. 
And this is a series I've been reading. I didn't miss anything. It's just one of those things like you can't win for trying no matter what you do. If you say 11, you get told it's 12. If you say it's 12, you get told it's 11. It's like Hulk 180, 181. Uh, This is why I hate that argument, and we need to define what is a first appearance and what isn't. And you know what I say the easiest way to do that is? But what I like about Second Prince when they do things like this with Second Prince, though, to kind of bring it back to this book, is – This gives you that seminal moment in the book on the cover, and it kind of adds some value to that book, makes that book kind of a little cooler. Um, I think Captain Marvel 11, we talked about second printings with Folklords and how difficult they are to get. Marvel will print up a second print whether they need to or not. They essentially do them as a variant cover. So uh, you can find Captain Marvel 11. That's an easily accessible book, but here there's the second print. We get kind of a new cover, and adds credence to the value of the book and i, I kind of like this cover i don't think it'll be hugely printed i don't think in the short term it'll have you know a lot of say demand but it's one to keep an eye out for in the long term and this just then i still haven't been reading captain marvel <laughs> thank you for the update though brother <laughs> but i tell you what though i gotta check when that trade's coming oh yeah uh, definitely i've said i'll pick it up and trade i'll read it it's just I'm not picking up right now. I might have to send that to you, buddy. But speaking with additional printings and Marvel, the next one we got Marauders number one. And this was actually a 1 in 25 incentive second print. I kind of like the cover. The cover's kind of cool, but I'm still not keen on incentive second print variants. Right. I love late printings. We've talked about this on the channel. But I'm getting such a mixed relationship with late printings. Because I'm tired of defending the independent comics and their use of late printings versus the expected use of the big twos. And then I hate what the big two is doing with late printings where, full disclosure, we don't have Batman Beyond 37 on the list. And everybody was asking why. Not everybody. There's a few people asking why. It's not a color change. They just change the – like put the background color a little different. Um, The book's easily accessible at Diamond because they overprint them for readers. They take all the collectability out of it, which is fine. If you wanted a copy to read and you didn't want to pay the flipper price that you see on eBay, great. But there's never going to be collectability in a second print of DC. You can't even sell the Batman Who Laughs first appearance, Teen Titans 12 second prints, for more than maybe 8 to 10 bucks at most on a good day. Um Marvel goes the opposite route with it. They, they're they making a collectible. Like I said, they'll print a second print if they don't need it. Um, I think Marauders, number one, is still an accessible book. I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure if I went on Midtown right now, I could pick up first prints for a cover price. But here's a second print. And even worse, here's a, a second print, one in 25 incentive. Now, I do think as a collectible, this will be rare. I don't know how many stores were ordering one, 25 copies of Marauder's number one second print. Um, this is also a story that's starting to kind of sneak up in popularity, Brian. There, I hear more and more people getting on the Marauder's train. So I think that that's interesting. But I also think that these kind of like this style of cover where you've kind of got like the floating in the air character – we see Frankie's Comics has one of these coming for in the future. For yeah, there's like negative space type books. Yeah, I, these are connecting with an audience. These are definitely connecting with an audience. It's not necessarily like my favorite, but I remember when I posted a, a image of a bunch of Frankie stuff coming out on our Instagram. Um, it was funny the way people reacted to that Marauders one. They really, really liked it. So um, I think there's something there. So I like I, – I'm 100% on board with you. Um, I really like this cover, even with its, its bootleg figment on it. Um, but I, I really I really like this cover. I think it's got a cool look. I just hate the whole concept of 125 incentives. So far we've covered the first appearance, we've covered reader buzz and variant buzz. So that just leaves us with one more thing, and that's Jack's long-term play. This is the one book that we haven't talked about, of course. It's Venom number 20. Now, this was the biggest book released this week. Easily. And usually the biggest book released does not go in the long-term play. 
section. The long-term play is not intended for that obvious book that everybody's going to talk about. It is intended for a book that maybe is being overlooked, maybe wouldn't have made the Bolo list if it wasn't for me putting it in this section. That's where I've talked about some G.I. Joe and Power Ranger stuff. I brought up some, um, you know, it's just some deep dive type things, Ninja Turtles, Star Trek even. Um, I've had a lot of books that I've been very, very, very right about, some that maybe haven't paid off yet. Um, this was a book everybody was on top of. But I want to highlight it, Brian, as a long-term play of the week for a reason. Not so much for what happened in the book, but for what didn't happen in the book. What didn't happen is, of course, Dylan did not become whatever symbiote everyone was expecting. And the thought was this was the last... And the, I don't know where we had a basis for this thought. We can get mad at Donnie Cates. But he never said this was going to happen definitively in this storyline. He just kept telling us every issue would be important. And shout out to Larry's comics. Um, I know Larry Doherty's been in the chat a lot. You know, he he commented on the bolo list saying like he was going to take Donnie's um, hype with a grain of salt, and I can understand that. But in another comment, Larry mentioned how almost every tie-in to Absolute Carnage was a minor key. So my argument to Larry, not so much argument, but just kind of my conversation with Larry, and this is my conversation with you guys out in the Simpleman's Comics family, is while it may not be the key you want, it is a key nonetheless. I think that we talked about Brian Absolute Carnage being the seminal story of this generation, right? This this generation's crossover. Um I think that once you remove the speculation hype from it, you can enjoy the story so much more and really see the master craftsmanship that Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman put into this series. Now, it plays off through multiple series. I mean, look at you. We just talked about Scream. This is a new Scream that we got out of this series. Um, there was a scene in... Issue five of Absolute Carnage, where we got a bunch of characters who had worn the symbiote who came in to save Captain America and Miles Morales, and they actually quoted Avengers Endgame. Like, there were just moments in these books that were absolutely out of this world amazing. Um, and my favorite part of the series, maybe more than the actual Absolute Carnage series itself has been this Venom run. It has, each book has given us another piece to the Dylan Brock puzzle. But I am happy to continue to kind of go down this road at the pace that Donny Cates wants to take it at. Um, I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I think Donny Cates is the best writer in comics today. And no matter how you feel about how he sells things on Twitter... I know that he's been heavily hyping Thor number one, and I know that the same man, Larry Doherty, said on that new comic book day, that will be the book he is going to be all over and putting all his money into. So Donny Cates does deliver at the same point. Um, this The issue with this all stems from the Dylan stuff. But here's the thing. In this book, we do have uh, the maker referencing his origin kind of hypothesizing where he believes, um, you know, Dylan kind of comes from. We also see the ultimate symbiote in a jar that has popped off the first appearance of the ultimate symbiote that's popped off first appearance of ultimate Eddie Brock. And then the two of them combining in an issue. Um, I still think the maker's first appearance is, grossly grossly undervalued um the maker seems to be more and more like a just really key element to this story and i think as we move further along with dylan i think we're going to see him more and more um i also think that the events of this book if we were to look at it like if we didn't have the Dylan thing going on and we just read this book. The book is a great read like every other Venom issue has been but if we look at the events of this book I think it would be enough to get people really excited about this book and it would have this book buzzing. I think there's just disappointment from people who pre-ordered stacks thinking this has to be the one. 
And I mean, if by now, if you want to take down a K2 with a grain of salt, it should just, it should just be the kind of thing where you realize, like, Donny Cates gets really excited about, like, what happens in this book he's really excited about. So it may not be the same thing you're excited about. He's not looking at it through a speculation lens. He's looking at it through kick-ass, awesome action, awesome storytelling. So when he says he's excited about a book, that's what he's promising you, and that's what he delivers week in and week out, month in and month out. Um, So I'm excited that Dylan is going to be here to stay at least for a while. And... uh, you know, I'm excited for Venom Island, and I think that's the point of an epilogue: is you you really feel good about the story that just ended, and you're excited for the the next story coming up. I can't ask for anything anything more than that. So I, I'll this is a book I'll be paying attention to to see if even if prices drop, I'd probably grab more. So this was a book that probably in most weeks would have been assumed to be a quick flip. Instead, it is the AK Mr. Bolo Long Term Play of the Week. And it may take a little longer than you want, but I think you're going to be happy in the long run. Right, so let us know in the comments, what were your thoughts on Venom number 20? I know a lot of people anticipated and then were delivered something different. But like we always say, the story was good. It's just what people were anticipating happened didn't happen. So we mentioned at the beginning of the show, House Lab Heroes is the sponsor of the show. But we also have another channel sponsor, of course, and that's Frankie's Comics. Make sure you guys check out frankiescomics.com. I'm talking about killing the game if you like exclusive variants. We just listed a couple up there right now. Currently, he has an Enhyak Lee variant for Thor number one. This is a gorgeous cover. Jack, you and I were talking about this before the show, right? Right. I, this is a home run cover. A-list artist. A title everyone's excited about. I just mentioned even our man Larry Doherty is pumped for this one. Um, so this is a highly anticipated release that now we have just a killer, killer variant for. And this is why I'm excited to be representing Frankie's Comics here in the YouTube comic community. Right, so that one's up available right now at frankiescomics.com as well as the Ninja Turtle 100. This is the Clayton Crane exclusive. This one's available up there with Trade Dress, Virgin, and also graded copies. And this is another thing I love that Frankie's does. He takes these cover artists like Clayton Crane or Synonymous with certain publishers and puts them on a different one. So again, this we got a Clayton Crane G.I. Joe a couple months back. Now we've got a Clayton Crane Ninja Turtles number 100. The just mega key issue for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This cover is absolutely dope, and I love that we get all five turtles on there. And that's available, I don't know if you said it, in trade dress and in Virgin. Yep, and graded copies are available for it. There you go. So up there right now, frankiescomics.com. If you're interested in those, make sure you check those out. We'll put a link in the description to both Slabbed Heroes and Frankie's Comics. But that's going to be the Bolo Show tonight, guys. Make sure you tune in tomorrow night where we have the last call where we are giving our 10 picks Four comic books that are hitting Final Order Cutoff this coming Monday night. That show is happening tomorrow, 9 p.m. premiere. Last week, we threw it up as a regular published video. And then we asked, do you guys like the live premiere so you can have the chat? Or do you just want it up there as a normal video? We got an outstanding please put up for live chat. So we listen to you. It's back to being premiered. And that's tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern. And if you're in the car because you're traveling from Thanksgiving and you don't have time to watch YouTube... These shows are all available on the Simple Man's Comics podcast. You can download those on Google Play, Apple, or Stitcher. So that way you can listen to them while you're traveling back from family. Hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving, and we will see you tomorrow night. They never really understand me. I need a comma like I need a Grammy. She needs to flow with her designer panties. Yeah, we eatin' plenty. Check the pantry from the sound waves to the rebel lines. From the tattered bridges to expensive dishes. Now we eating ends with these new beginnings. Yet the sign of major.